I do have a, a, a little bit of a, uh, of a background in this industry. Uh, I, I was told in, in some way, you're, you're going to take this and I'm going to get in trouble. Oh, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another restraining order. <laughs> the, uh, I, I've, I've been touted as one of the few guys in this industry of cannabis that's put more than 100,000 people in jail for this stuff. Okay, and now, be careful, because uh, you turn around and now we're making a legitimate business. So, uh, you never know where you're going to be in a few years. Uh, so, we're going to talk about uh, uh, a, an overview of the cannabis industry. Uh, I've got several different lectures that I give on the cannabis uh, industry, and, uh, uh, one just on pesticides, one just on extractions, uh, uh, but we're, we're going to do an overview here. Uh, let's start with the map. Now, my map is a little bit out of date. Uh, the, uh, the dark colors here, uh, Washington, Colorado, uh, they are uh, states that have recreational cannabis also. Uh, Oregon should be dark now. Alaska should be dark, and Washington, D.C. should be dark now. Okay, uh, just yesterday, Ohio went up for vote, and it was shot down in Ohio. Uh, but uh, right now I've got 24 states that, uh, that I work in for, uh, for the cannabis industry. Uh, if most noticeably, uh, the Bible Belt is absent. <laughs> okay? uh, eventually, it will go nationwide. It's going to happen. Uh, just, uh, you may agree with it, you may not agree with it. Uh, you're, you're, uh, support your views either way. But uh, uh, it's going to go nationwide sooner or later. Uh, these are some pictures that I took personally. Uh, cannabis, uh, if we start with, uh, uh, always the leaflets have uh, uh, an odd number of uh, leaflets. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, I'm always looking for a good 13 uh, to put to my collection, but it's, it's got to be a pr pretty good sized plant to, uh, to have a 13. Uh, some of the, uh, the other ones are, uh, are buds uh, or, or stalks. Uh, uh, this is a clean bud, sometimes called kind bud, uh, but uh, basically it is a, a bud without uh, seeds, without uh, uh, much uh, unusable uh, product in it. Uh, microscopically, uh, it will have uh, several different types of hairs on it. Uh, this is a, a, a portion of the leaf that uh, has some bulbous hairs on it. And it will also have some bear claw shaped hairs that are uh, often called systolithic hairs. At the base of the hair is uh, actually a, a salt crystal of calcium carbonate. So if you were to put a, a drop of acid on it, it would actually effervesce. Uh, but there's only a, a certain number of uh, plants in the uh, uh, in the plant kingdom that would have those, uh, uh, those types of hairs on it. And that's one thing that we might do in order to identify canvas is to microscopically look, uh, look for some of those hairs. And then maybe even add some acid to see the effervescence. Okay. Uh, I travel all over the country uh, in, uh, uh, in the cannabis industry. Uh, let's uh, differentiate the dispensaries, which are, are typically uh, uh, for medicinal cannabis and uh, retail stores, which are more for recreational. Okay, now there's only four states right now that have uh, retail stores um, and the, uh, the District of Columbia, but all of the other uh, uh, locations have medicinal uh, uh, dispensaries also. Now, um, let's give you a little bit of idea of how many of these uh, dispensaries there might be. In some communities, there are more cannabis dispensaries than there are Starbucks coffee shops. Oh, and 7-Elevens <laughs> and McDonald's combined. Okay? There, is, there are some stores or some places in Denver, let's say, uh, that uh, I've got two dispensaries on every block. Okay, and there's enough business to keep these stores open. Okay, uh, these are some of the things that, uh, that I bought in some of the dispensaries. Uh, I couldn't buy uh, as much as I wanted. Here's where I'm going to get in trouble right now. Uh, I could not buy everything uh, because as an out-of-state uh, person, you're only allowed to buy 7 grams per day. Uh, an in-state person, they're allowed to have 28 grams per day or an entire ounce. Okay, uh, so I made my wife buy some of these things too. <laughs> so, now that uh, uh, that conservative little Catholic girl, uh, her, 
our, our children uh, uh, say, Mom, you bought more pop than we ever had. <laughs> okay. It's good to know. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the things that you can uh, get in the store, now this is a, just a one gram uh, uh, baggie that I, I, could, uh, I could buy, and I could go in and, and choose from maybe 20 or 30 different cookie jars, each with, each with its own strain of uh, cannabis in it. And you can choose what you would like to uh, uh, use it for. Is it for recreational use? Is it for uh, medicinal use? Uh, uh, you're trying to get rid of uh, a certain chronic pain or something? Uh, what is the right prescription that might uh, suit your needs? So there's all sorts of different choices that you can use. Uh, some of them are, uh, are uh, free form uh, buying like that. Some of them are pre-packaged in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, bottles that are child-proof and in a, in a box, a sealed box, so that uh, children who get a hold of it uh, should not be able to see it, tell what it is. Uh, but on the inside, it's basically uh, an entire bud like this. Uh, cannabis is uh, expensive in some of these stores. It can be uh, uh, more than a thousand to two thousand dollars per pound. Okay, uh, it's more expensive than uh, clandestine cannabis on, on the streets. Uh, you have all the, uh, the state legislation uh, that, is, uh, that has to be uh, backing up the cannabis industry and the inspectors. Uh, so a, a single gram could easily cost 15, 20 bucks for, uh, for just that much, which is enough for maybe three joints, maybe four joints or so. Uh, medicinal cannabis is a little bit cheaper, uh, but it's, uh, it's still more expensive than what you'd find uh, uh, out on the streets. Uh, all right, so I've got about 24 states that I work with right now. I've got more than 2,000 cultivators or growers, more than 2,000 dispensaries, 200 retail stores. I've got about uh, 500 different kitchens that I work with uh, uh, that take the canvas and make other products out of the canvas. We're going to talk about that more. Uh, I've got more than 60 testing laboratories that I work with right now. Uh, now, on the, uh, on the federal aspect, it is still against the law to have uh, uh, cannabis in your profession, but uh, the federal government uh, realizing that this is coming about, let's face it, they are kind of slow in passing laws, so uh, an assistant attorney general by the last name of Cole has put out a couple of different memos that say, we respect the state's right to not enforce federal laws uh, in, in their own jurisdictions, therefore we will not uh, come in and uh, just blindly enforce these laws unless it's one of eight different circumstances that uh, uh, that makes sense uh, for for them to get involved. For instance, it cannot be sold to anyone under 21. Uh, it cannot uh, have any uh, kind of uh, ties to organized crime or to gangs. Uh, it cannot be grown on federal property. And there's a couple of others, but they all make fairly good sense that. Uh, uh, if you just keep your nose clean, uh, you should not have federal government uh, coming down in order to inspect you. That doesn't mean that they can't reserve the right to do this at any moment. Okay, so there's, uh, there's fear in the industry of that. Uh, the, uh, in, in 2013, the cannabis industry did $1.4 billion worth of business. Last year, 2.2. We've already surpassed $3 billion this year and it's only November uh, for, uh, uh, so this is a growing, growing market. Uh, it's projected to get up to eight billion, at which point in time it will be larger than the National Football League. Okay, so this is a, a growing, growing industry, but it's an industry in infancy uh, that it's got a lot of growing pains of trying to figure out what's the right way to do some of these things. Uh, in the, uh, in the testing laboratories, well, okay, the last talk that I gave, uh, gave was in Oregon. It looks like I didn't take that out, but uh, uh, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission actually uh, uh, controls the, uh, the testing and the governing of uh, cannabis. Uh, here in Illinois, it's a different, uh, uh, it, it's the uh, Department of Agriculture here in, in Illinois. Uh, but uh, definitions uh, are now emerging of what uh, different laboratories should be looking for in the, in the testing of this. Uh, so there are no standard protocols of how to do the testing yet. That's something that this industry is lacking. We now have a newly formed uh, group 
within the AOAC and within the ACS that only deal with cannabis, okay? So even the American Chemical Society has a, uh, a division for, for just uh, uh, cannabis. Uh, testing is, uh, is expensive, okay? And it has been uh, touted as having widely varying results. We're gonna talk a little bit about why some of these uh, results can be so, uh, so varied. Uh, but product safety issues uh, are, are some of the biggest concerns. Uh, one of the biggest things that is uh, uh, a challenge in the industry is banking, okay? Uh, the cannabis is a Schedule One controlled substance, uh, according to the, uh, the Federal Register. And uh, as that, the banks, which are insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, want no part of this business. Okay? So they don't want your money. To them, it's money laundering okay, from, drug, uh, from the drug trade. So this is very much a cash business. Uh, I have taken instruments before to states that, uh, that, that it was legal, and I was offered, uh, well, let's see, that, those instruments might be worth uh, $350,000. Okay? There's 12 suitcases over there. Pick one. Okay? <laughs> and uh, take one of those and leave the instruments here. I have no place to deposit $350,000. <laughs> We don't have a bank account with a deposit slip to put that in there. So uh, some of this stuff is, is a little bit difficult uh, in, in dealing with cash businesses. Startups uh, all, often have a uh, uh, the credit denied because they, uh, they can't be trusted for, uh, uh, to be able to stay in business. Uh, some of the easiest ways that people are getting into it is if they had a pesticide laboratory that was an operational laboratory, now they're looking for different uh, types of samples that they could use. So expanding into the cannabis industry is usually easier than if they started up just uh, to do only cannabis. All right, so the overall goal uh, for the laboratory and for the entire industry is to produce a quality product for the purpose intended, now, whether that's medicinal or whether it's recreational and have a reproducible product with reproducible results. You could have one strain of cannabis that uh, for a while it was very, very good for uh, reducing uh, some symptoms uh, of, let's say, pain, okay? But if you change something in the growing or the processing, and now you change something in the plant, maybe it doesn't do that anymore. Maybe it doesn't produce the re uh, required results anymore. What's different? Okay, so we're going to try to uh, uh, find some ways to, uh, uh, to get more reproducible results for the consumer. Ultimately, a safer product to protect the customer is, uh, is what we're after. Now, uh, many different variables uh, that can affect the, uh, uh, the end product. Uh, the quality of seed stock, uh, root stock, grafting. Nobody plants by seeds anymore. Okay, everything, uh, you know, maybe they planted by seeds the first time, but then they take a rootstock and they graft onto the uh, rootstock. That way they can actually get six, seven, even eight crops a year, as opposed to growing by seed, they might be limited to only one or two crops per year. Nobody grows outdoors. I, I know one or two that, that grow outdoors, but everything's done inside now. Uh, I hate to say this, but there is a, uh, uh, a warehouse district in Las Vegas, so uh, two blocks off of the uh, off of the strip, two two blocks off of Las Vegas Boulevard. Okay, it it has uh, many different uh, warehouses in it uh, that were empty for years. Now every one of them is filled up with a grow facility. Okay, two blocks on them from the some of the most expensive storefronts on the planet. Uh, grow conditions. Uh, well, let's talk about genetics as, as, as strain and identification, tracking. Uh, trying to find out uh, what strain, what do we have to do in order to produce the same uh, results for, uh, for the customer. And some of it is genetics, some of it is, uh, uh, is how you grow the plant. Grow conditions like light, water, minerals, fertilizer, grow media, pest control, uh, all can affect the, uh, uh, the final product. Um, Harvest time, even when you plant uh, and, and when you uh, uh, think that the product is ready, when is the right time to actually harvest it in order to, uh, uh, to produce the best product? How you dry it, what temperature, for how long can influence uh, the, uh, the product. Uh, some of the terpenes that are in there could actually evaporate away and, uh, uh, and change the potency of the, uh, 
uh, of the product. Uh, the laboratory testing itself, the storage time, storage temperature, uh, whether it goes to a dispensary, how long does it sit in their uh, store before it's actually sold, uh, as to what is the, uh, uh, the shelf life of some of this stuff. Okay, so many, many different variables can go into, uh, into the final product. So in the laboratory, like I say, in infant industry, going through growing pains right now. We're going to talk about some of the tests that are done in the, in the laboratory. Now, every state is different. One of the problems is, is that with 24 different states and no backing by the federal government, every state is doing their own uh, types of analyses, uh, making their own methods. Uh, there is no consistency around the country. Okay? We're trying to work towards that. Okay, but it's going to take a while. Uh, genetics and strain identification, uh, a lot of the growers would really, really like to get a handle on. But that's not something that the state is going to say, you have to do this kind of testing. But the growers really, really want to know that kind of information. Macroscopic and microscopic examinations, uh, moisture content, microbiological, bacterial uh, investigations, potency uh, of, uh, of THC, potency of terpenes. We'll talk more about those. Residual solvents, heavy metals, pesticides, even homogeneity testing is not something that uh, most states do right now, but we're going to talk about uh, how do you know that, uh, uh, that this sample is, uh, uh, is the same, whether I take a sample from over here or over here, or if you make an edible, if you make some pizza out of, uh, out of cannabis, how do you know that this bite of pizza is the same as the next bite of pizza? Okay. Now, of these up here, potency to the most extent, and to a smaller extent, extent terpenes, uh, that analysis can increase the value of the product. All the others up there can take a very expensive $2,000 a pound product and make it worthless. Okay? So the, uh, uh, the growers really do not want to know that they have pesticides or heavy metals in there because uh, they can't sell it then. Okay? So they would love those things to be zeros, but they want to know that number, they want to know that the potency is higher than their competition so that they can get more money from their product. Okay, so some of the, uh, the problems in the cannabis laboratory, there's many, many, many different components uh, that are in, the, in a plant. Uh, so it's a very complex uh, uh, plant, and the ratios of some of the components are always changing. The ratios, some of the ratios that are in there, we need to get a handle on in order to produce a similar working product uh, for, uh, for each patient. Uniformity of uh, sampling. Okay, what part of the plant? If I take a bud from this side of the plant versus a bud from this side of the same plant versus a bud from up on the top, it may not give you the same results because Mother Nature doesn't put everything uh, just equally. Uh, so if I were to get if I were to work in the tea industry, okay, I would ask for one kilo of tea, and then I would grind up that entire kilo, okay, and then I'd take a representative sample of that, okay. But a kilo of this, 2.2 pounds at $2,000 per pound, you're talking about close to five grand to submit a sample. There's no grower who's going to give up five grand of his profits to get one test done. Okay? So in this industry, it's, uh, it's difficult to get a representative sample. In some of the states, I see as little as 0.5 grams being submitted. In some states, as much as 12 grams being submitted. Come on, tell me that with 0.5 grams of a sample, is that really uh, representative of everything that I might find out of a 10-pound lot of uh, plant material? No, in no way. Okay. So this is one of the reasons that, uh, uh, that some of the testing is, uh, uh, is different from one laboratory to another, okay. is, uh, is the representative sample. Okay. Now, on microscopic and macroscopic, uh, uh, some of the, uh, basically the state regulations for botanical products will come in here. And if we look at color consistency, does it look right does, or does it look like oregano? Okay. Uh, uh, contaminants. Let's look for debris, stem seeds, any foreign matter uh, that, uh, that's larger than about three millimeters in size or so. Uh, and we want to make certain there's less than about 5% of this foreign matter that's in there. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's got debris in there that's that useful for the, uh, for the product. Adulterants that we have seen before. 
Uh, I've seen finely powdered sand that's been added to cannabis before because it shimmers like the, uh, uh, like the oily resin that's on the surface of, of the plant. I've even seen finely powdered lead uh, added to the plant, okay? That, uh, because it adds a great deal of weight to it, okay? Now tell me that's safe for the consumer, in no way, okay? Moisture content. Okay, typically we want to see less than 15% moisture content. Uh, National uh, Evaluation, uh, National Tech uh, Evaluation Program, NTEP, is one uh, uh, protocol for following here. But there is no nat one, absolutely the only way to look for, uh, 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 for, uh, for moisture content. Matter of fact, uh, weight loss on drying can be uh, uh, deceiving because if you heat it like some uh, uh, protocols, uh, for 105 degrees for two hours, you get rid of the water, but you can also evaporate some of these the lighter terpenes that affect the ratios of terpene to cannabinoids that you might want to know as to uh, how they uh, uh, affect a, uh, uh, a patient. Okay, uh, total ash and acid and insoluble ash, but uh, these are some of the things that we would do uh, for, uh, uh, for the initial testing. Now, micro, microbiological testing, mold, mildew, fungus, bacteria, okay. Uh, one of the previous slides that you saw earlier was a, a test in order to look for uh, uh, aflatoxins and micro, uh, mycotoxins, okay. Uh, some of the, those things are on EPA's hit list, uh, that uh, they're very uh, carcinogenic, very poisonous. Uh, simple things like E. coli and salmonella, okay. Now, some of these are done by petri dish cultures, some of them are even done by polymerase chain reactions, some are done by HPLCMS, or other things, uh, uh, other tests uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be used for, uh, uh, for these types of, uh, uh, of, of compounds. Uh, I don't know how to read a petri, uh, petri dish culture, but uh, I need a biologist to do that part. So you need a biologist on staff, you need a, a chemist on staff, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of these things, if we extract the uh, cannabis into edibles and beverages or vapors, uh, these things just condense themselves and, and uh, get more concentrated with the extract and just increases the toxicity for them. So uh, the, the grower does not want to, um, uh, to fail this test because his entire crop is, uh, is got to be thrown away. Right, so here's the uh, aflatoxins. Uh, this is uh, done by HPLC with either a, a photodiode ray detector or, or with a mass spec. Uh, so uh, aspergillus uh, is uh, some of that stuff that's really on the hit list for uh, US EPA right now. Potency is by far the most requested analysis. Okay? Now, I hate to say uh, uh, the term potency because it's really a misnomer, but that's what the industry calls it. Uh, potency should really uh, take into account all of the different components that are, that are in the cannabis, not just THC. Uh, it is a synergy between uh, uh, all of the different compounds that Mother Nature puts into this plant that produces the effect. But for consistency, we're going to call it potency because that's what the, uh, the, uh, the industry calls it. Uh, there's more than 40 <laughs> different cannabinoids in, uh, in the plant, but there's eight main cannabinoids that we might look for. Uh, THC acid, uh, carboxylic or cannabidiolic acid, uh, delta 9 THC, cannabidiol, delta 8 THC, uh, cannabichromine, cannabigerol, uh, cannabinol. We could also look for cannabigerol acid. Uh, the, the key things that I'm, uh, I'm telling you there is that there are acid forms for some of the drugs and there are neutral forms for some of the drugs. The acid forms are typically most common in the drug. Uh, so the uh, uh, the biggest component that would be in cannabis is not THC, but it's THC acid. It has a carboxylic uh, acid functional group on the, uh, on the molecule. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, has drug capability in and of itself. Okay? Uh, in looking at recreational uh, marijuana, typically we would like to look at the psychoactive THC itself. Uh, that produces the euphoric effect, okay? But in medicinal marijuana, it's typically the cannabidiol that has more of the, of the medicinal effect and with less of the euphoric effect. Uh, so there's the differences in different strains that would be used for either recreational cannabis or for medicinal cannabis. 
Uh, but now THC acid is the largest component in there, uh, but when it gets hot, now whether that's by smoking, or whether it's by baking, or whether it's by the heat of a GC injector, that carboxylic acid will fall off of the, uh, of the molecule and will turn into the neutral THC, okay? Uh, so by doing this, by gas chromatography, you're gonna lose a lot of that THC acid, and it's not a predictable amount as to, uh, as to how much, it's not gonna go to completion. Uh, therefore, uh, 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 THC, is, uh, uh, THC acid is typically done by HPLC instead of by gas chromatography. Now, uh, medicinal cannabis is usually higher in, in uh, cannabidiol and lower in THC. Now, in the late 70s, I wrote an article for, uh, uh, for a little publication called Microgram. Anybody here ever know what Microgram is? Okay. All right, so if you know what Microgram is, we have similar backgrounds because it's not something that uh, everybody has access to. Okay, uh, but uh, I wrote this article and it was uh, published two places. One was in Microgram, the other was in High Times. Ah. Okay, <laughs> and uh, basically what I did is I, uh, I looked at uh, uh, the potency of THC from uh, different uh, cannabis sources uh, around the world. And, uh, oh, here in the United States, if you got 3% THC, uh, in, in Iowa, Iowa ditch wheat was about 0.25% THC. Really crappy stuff, but yeah, it was free. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, good Mexican was four uh, percent. You get down into some Jamaican or or, or some Colombian, and you get five percent. Pretty good Thai sticks were were six percent. That was kick ass shit back then. Now, um, everything nowadays, okay, is over twenty percent THC, over twenty five percent THC, pushing thirty percent THC. Okay, uh, that's the kind of uh, concentration I would have expected to find uh, in, uh, in hashish back then. So now we've got plants that are producing uh, enough potency to, that, that used to be uh, limited only to, uh, uh, to hashish. All right, so now the, the question between gas chromatography and liquid chromatography uh, is basically whether you want to see the acid forms or not. Okay, now different states have different rules. Okay, there is uh, one state that says, uh, well, we're just interested in total THC. We don't care whether it's an acid or, or whether it's the, uh, uh, the neutral form. Uh, just do it by gas chromatography. It's quick, cheap, and easy. Uh, that's good enough. Okay? Uh, so uh, that's where gas chromatography can come in. It's uh, quick, cheap, and easy. Okay? But the acid forms are, are converted, to the, converted to the free forms, and it's an incomplete conversion efficiency. So you really don't know how much of the acid forms. So from a medicinal standpoint, you really don't know how much of the THC acid there uh, is there. So uh, HPLC is by far the preferred performance uh, for, uh, uh, for looking at the acid forms. Now whether it's by a UV detector, whether it's by a photodiode array, whether it's by a mass spec, uh, depends what, uh, what you have available to you. It's typically slower, has a longer cobration time. You have solvent consumption and disposal. Uh, but it does detect the free and acid forms, okay? So now the total THC would be a combination of the THC plus the THC acid. Now they'll use a conversion factor of uh, uh, THC acid times uh, 0.877 in order to uh, 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 account for the carboxylic acid group that is on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, on the molecule. The same thing for the, uh, the cannabidiol would be the, uh, the free cannabidiol plus the cannabidiol acid, and it has a different conversion factor uh, uh, to take care of the, uh, uh, the acid forms. All right, a couple of uh, typical chromatograms uh, in, in GC. Okay, we've got the cannabichromine, uh, cannabidiol, uh, delta-8 THC, delta-9 THC, and uh, cannabigerol, and uh, cannabinol. Uh, cannabinol should not be in there in any appreciable amount in a, uh, in a plant form that just came off the plant because that's an indication of uh, the decomposition of, uh, of the plant. Uh, poor storage, too hot, uh, as that starts to come up, it uh, tells you that your plant is, is aging. So on a, on a fresh plant, there should be very little or none uh, in there. But here's a strain that is high in uh, uh, THC, and here's a, a, a strain that is high in cannabidiol. 
Okay, now uh, here by HPLC, some of the same components, the THC acid is much higher here. Okay, uh, where on uh, this, this is the same sample run by GC, run by HPLC. But here the main peak is uh, uh, delta 9 THC. Here the main peak is uh, uh, THC acid, where there's just a little bit of the THC uh, by itself in the uh, uh, in, in the plant material. Whereas in this uh, in this sample right here, there is a great deal of uh, cannabidiol, okay, and the uh, uh, the THC acid uh, is uh, uh, not quite as large, uh, but uh, uh, you've got a, a, a good amount of the uh, cannabidiol that would uh, tell me that that's more of a, uh, a strain used for uh, uh, medicinal purposes. Okay, now uh, uh, getting on to some other uh, uh, HPLC chromatograms, uh, that's what we're going to uh, use uh, specifically. Uh, some states and some customers will do this very, very rapidly uh, in literally about two minutes or so in order to get as much uh, information as they can and as much sample throughput. Okay, but there's some, uh, some compounds that are not resolved here. Now, they are very, very small compounds. So are they willing to live with that amount of error so that they can get done in, in about two minutes or so? That's, that's one school of thought. But if we were to slow it down a little bit more, we can get better resolution. Now, it might take uh, eight or nine minutes in order to get better resolution on that. Uh, so how important is it to you in order to get every component uh, uh, separated? That, that's the... You know, put on a box of gloves in your laboratory and, and duke it out and uh, figure out which way is more important to you. Uh, the, uh, the quality of the chromatography or the speed of the analysis. There's always a trade-off there in industry. Okay? Uh, potency by infrared. Okay? Uh, we have, uh, uh, in beta testing right now, uh, infrared analysis that is capable of detecting and quantitating the THC, the THC acid, the cannabidiol, cannabidiolized acid, uh, moisture, and 12 of the terpenes, all in 15 seconds by one infrared. Okay, uh, that's something that we're just going to be introducing to the, uh, to the industry. I'm going around the country telling people about it. Uh, what this can be used for? This is not going to be a replacement for the liquid chromatography. Which is going to be more more uh, uh, more accurate, okay? But if the growing facility use this for screening to be able to tell what they're growing right now, this is simple enough that a, a non-scientific person in the uh, uh, in the growing facility would be able to do that right now, 15 uh, seconds or so, so that they can tell this particular lot as to uh, uh, how what kind of conditions it's in, okay? But in addition, I see it as going into every dispensary, of which we've got more than 2,000 of them, so that you would be able to look at the, the purchaser, the, the, the consumer, would be able to get a, a potency test right there when he's ready to buy as to what he's going to be purchasing. Okay? So that may be very beneficial for, uh, uh, for the dispensaries as well. Uh, terpenes. Okay? There are terpenes on many, many, many plants. Okay? Uh, and uh, Mother Nature puts uh, lots of these into, uh, uh, into plants, and uh, the terpenes have uh, uh, different uh, medicinal effects to themselves, things like ginseng and, and mint and, and uh, uh, all of the, uh, the spices and, and herbs. They'll have uh, uh, terpenes in them. Even pine trees have, uh, have, have many of these terpenes in them. Uh, so these... Uh, these ratios of the cannabinoids to several of the different terpenes. Uh, it is not just the cannabinoids that's responsible for some of the medicinal effects. It's the ratio, the synergy between all of the different cannabinoids and all of the different terpenes that need to be taken into account in order to figure out uh, this particular ratios are useful for this particular of an effect on a patient. Okay, and it's going to take us a, quite a while in order to get databases uh, that, uh, that can come up with uh, uh, logical uh, uh, correlations between uh, uh, these, uh, these ratios of, of terpenes and cannabinoids uh, to, uh, to the patients. Uh, but it's the synergy of the cannabinoids and the terpenes that's, that's important. And the cannabinoids, if we're, if we're talking about uh, uh, THC being 20-25% of, uh, 
uh, of, of the plant weight. Okay, some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the terpenes might account for two to three and a half percent by weight. Okay, so it might be 10% lower, or 10% of, uh, uh, of the cannabinoids, but they're still uh, drug producing effects of, of the terpenes also that need to be taken into account for the, uh, uh, for the ultimate ratios, you know, the ultimate uh, effects. Uh, so of the terpenes, uh, there are, uh, uh, these, these are just some of them. And now some of these can be done by uh, I prefer to do it by GCMS because uh, if, if you get a complex uh, uh, plant material, uh, trying to define uh, just uh, by retention time what they are, uh, you may be opening yourself up to a little bit of error. So I, I prefer GCMS for this. Uh, it could be done by a liquid injection of GCMS. It could also be done by headspace of GCMS. There's pros and cons to each one. <coughs> okay. uh, the, uh, uh, the headspace uh, has a tendency to uh, be easier, and you can do other analyses like uh, residual solvents at the same time, but you may not get everything uh, up into the vapor phase that you did with a liquid extract. Uh, so whichever way your laboratory prefers, I see it done both ways uh, in, in many different laboratories. <coughs> then the terpenes will be on the low end of the chromatogram, the pesticides in this range, but then the uh, cannabinoids are typically out here at the, uh, the higher end. Uh, of the uh, uh, of the chromatogram, uh, one of the largest uh, components would uh, in there would be uh, caryophyllene. Uh, some people will call it caryophyllene. Uh, you say potato, you say I say potato, uh, whichever way you prefer to uh, pronounce it. But uh, caryophyllene and uh, uh, humulene and uh, mercy, those are some of the largest uh, uh, components that are uh, of, of the terpenes that are in this plant. Now pesticides. The most controversial uh, investigation that's, that's in the laboratory. It's, it's there for the safety of the consumer, okay? but there are so many different ways that we could, uh, we could do these, uh, uh, these pesticide analyses. Uh, it's the, the, the target compounds between all the different states are usually very poorly defined. Uh, one state, when they first started, said, uh, well, yeah, we've got to do terpenes. Well, which terpenes are we going to do? Well, we'll do all of them. Okay. Well, that, that's over 3,000 different uh, pesticides that they might have to look at. Okay. That's uh, not going to be very economical or feasible to do. So let's start making a, uh, uh, a subset of what we're going to look for. And uh, uh, so if we, several of the states are, are hung up on looking at all organochlorine, pesticides, organophosphates, pyrethroids, and carbamic pesticides. Well, if we look at those, now we've limited ourselves to about 500 different pesticides. Getting better, but there's still a great deal to, uh, uh, to, be, do, uh, to be done here. Uh, the biggest problem that, uh, that the growers will have is, uh, is with mites. Uh, and basically, it's because uh, many of these plants are grown indoors, and there is a lack of natural predators. Uh, indoors, uh, therefore you get mites on any of them, uh, and uh, they just go rampant with, uh, with nothing to, uh, uh, to kill them. So uh, most everybody is using some kind of a, uh, of a pesticide in order to control those, uh, those mites. Uh, but without specific methods for doing all of these things, uh, we find that GCMS is uh, uh, tried and true for many of the pesticides, but some of them cannot be done by GCMS. Some of them have to be done by LCMS. Okay, so there is no one procedure that will do all of the pesticides. Therefore, some of the laboratories have to buy two expensive pieces of, uh, of equipment uh, in order to do this analysis. It makes it more, uh, more costly and more time consuming. Uh, there is, uh, let's see, uh, some of the states are uh, insisting that there is a library search of non-target analytes also. Okay, which basically uh, they probably read that in some GC brochure with a uh, uh, you know, with a NIST library search or something like that. They say, "Oh yeah, it sounds good to us." Uh, I realize that some of these are legislators that are, that are writing this stuff, and, and with uh, uh, with little or no uh, uh, consultation to scientists, that uh, they could tell them how to do it better. So we're getting there. Okay, uh, 
So some of the traditional ways of, of looking at pesticides, you can do it by FID or ECD or NPD, but they're not specific enough, they're not sensitive enough, and uh, uh, nobody's doing them by, by bees. There are some laboratories that would like to do it by that so that they can do it cheap and easy, but there's no way they're gonna get all the, uh, all the compounds that they're supposed to be looking for just by uh, a cheap detector like that. So basically it means we have to uh, uh, have some sort of mass spec in here. I do an entire lecture on just this slide, okay? We can't do all of that right now. So, so uh, whether it's a GCMS with a single quad, a triple quad, or a QTOF, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to all, uh, all of the different instruments. Uh, which one is right for, uh, for you depends on what your state is asking you to see. But now we need to get into uh, LC also. Now some places try to do it just by LC with a UV detector. But again, we need to get into the mass spec realm, whether it's a single quad, a mass spec with the time of flight, uh, or a, a QTOF, a quadrupole with a TOF attached to it. Makes it much more expensive, but there's a lot more information that you can get gear from that. Uh, you can uh, use a triple quad. Uh, which has more sensitivity, but it's, it's pretty poor for unknowns as, as to if you have a, uh, a complete unknown that you don't know what's, uh, what that peak is. All right, so there's all sorts of routine methods uh, for pesticides that are out there that the EPA has, uh, has put in there, uh, but there's no one official method for the pesticides in botanicals yet. Uh, it's going to take a while to, uh, to get that going. Uh, so if we have uh, 3,000 different pesticides, too expensive, but expensive hardware, and it reduces the ana uh, analysis list uh, to reduce the cost. Uh, if we go down to these, uh, these different classes, well, some are best done by LC, some are best done by GC. Okay, so doing it just by those classes is probably not the, uh, uh, the way that this should be done. Uh, now, a couple of different states uh, are trying to make uh, target lists of what to look for. For instance, Oregon has a list of 59 target components, and they put a maximum level on each component. Uh, sounds all well and good, right? Nevada has 74 different uh, components. Um, now, I've been in contact uh, in the past month with at least 12 growers, okay, who have told me that they don't care what's on those lists up there. They have every intention of using some of the pesticides that are not on that list because they know that nobody's looking for them, okay? So that doesn't do any good for the, uh, uh, for the consumer, okay? But that, what that means is that we're gonna have unknown components that are not target components that we really need to be screening for also, okay? The state of Washington did it a little bit different. The state of Washington says there are 13 non-approved compounds. You cannot use these in any way, shape, or form. So that means the analyst has to look for everything else, okay? Um, and uh, so just what the, and all of the approved pesticides that they have are natural oils, and they're not truly chemical pesticides. Okay, so uh, uh, with different states, um, it, it's all over the board. Here in Illinois, uh, Illinois has said, we're gonna use uh, EPA pesticide list for edible foods. Well, I haven't figured out really what non-edible foods are, okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, that's, that's, what it's, that's what it says in the, in the law. Uh, which leaves us to about 500 different components, and they say that at levels equal to the lowest food levels, which typically means milk levels, okay? So this means that sensitivity is very, very, very important to, uh, uh, to hear in, uh, uh, in Illinois, whereas uh, that might be uh, on, the, on the range of uh, uh, 10 part per billion, whereas some of the other states, uh, uh, like Oregon, has uh, 100 parts per billion. Uh, that uh, of any particular pesticide as their cutoff level. Uh, so the cutoff levels are, uh, are all over the board also. Illinois has 22 growers, four laboratories right now. But non-approved pesticides are not required for screening, but is it safe for the consumer? Okay, so this, this is, this is a, uh, uh, a problem, a growing pain that this industry is going to have to go through. And EPA, this is right off of their website, says uh, anal anal analytical methods for measuring pesticide residues. And they say right here that uh, uh, the pesticide residue methods in this are in the process of validating the available <laughs> residue analytical methods. Okay, and once validated, they'll be up on this page, but they're not there right now. 
what they will give you is a list of unvalidated methods, okay, in, in order to do some of these things. Basically, what they're doing is they're, they're transitioning from a lot of GCMS methods over to LCMS methods, okay? But it's going to take a while to get some kind of semblance of, uh, uh, of validation for some of this stuff. Okay, uh, here's uh, Oregon's uh, pesticide list. There's 59 pesticides there. Uh, and uh, they're going to need both GCMS and LCMS in, in order to, uh, uh, to accommodate that entire list. Uh, some of the reporting limits uh, vary uh, a great deal from uh, uh, you know, 50 parts per billion uh, up to about uh, uh, 4,000 parts per billion for some of the components. Okay? So that's a pretty broad range of, uh, of calibration curves for, uh, for some of these things. Uh, again, growing pains in the industry. Okay? Some states literally have it in there that says, we require a library searchable spectrum. One of them literally names NIST for being a library searchable spectrum. Okay? Uh, NIST is not the only library out there, it's just, just, uh, just one of them. Uh, but they want some type of a, uh, of a library search in order to, uh, to figure out uh, what these unknown components are. Uh, here's a typical uh, detection of 130 different pesticides by LCMS, a lot of color-coded stuff and things that are right on top of each other, but knowing which, uh, uh, which ions to go, uh, uh, go with which, uh, which compounds, uh, then you can let a computer kind of sort that out. But there again, it needs mass spec, uh, and mass spec, mass spec, whether it's uh, uh, mass spec by time of flight or whether it's by a triple quad, uh, but some kind of uh, uh, LCMS in, in order to, uh, to sort complex chromatograms like this out. Okay, and then it can go through and, and look at uh, lots of nice little color-coded things and tell you what was found and how much was there and, and chemical uh, 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 chemical formulas uh, with, uh, with exact mass to uh, three or four decimal places or so. Okay, heavy metals. I am not an inorganic chemist. I'm going to talk about this just very briefly because I don't understand how they uh, uh, do the, uh, the heavy metals. But uh, looking at, uh, at lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, not every state is looking for the heavy metals right now. We know it's there, but not every state has said go out and buy a, uh, an ICP mass spec in order to do all these things yet. They will eventually up here the AOT. Okay? Right now, only a few states are asking for the heavy metals. Okay? Some of the states are asking for chromium in, uh, in addition to that. And it's typically down in the tens of, uh, of parts per billion. Uh, 10, 15, 20 parts per billion that they're looking at for some of these heavy metals. Uh, now, even grow lights, okay? uh, mercury vapor uh, lamps or the fluorescent lights up here okay, that have mercury in them can impart mercury into the plant material itself, even just in the, uh, the growing process. Okay? Now, concentrates. Um, looking at uh, taking the, uh, the plant material and doing something else with it other than just plant material for smoking. There's a whole other, other side of the industry for extracts. Uh, a couple of different ways that you can do uh, uh, the, uh, the extraction. Uh, realize that this stuff is pretty high potency already, 20, 25, and 30% THC. If you were to just take that, uh, that plant material and rub it against a coarse screen, some of the hairs that we were talking about, the cyst-lithic hairs, the bulbous hairs that have the, uh, the resin sticking to it, could fall through the screen and they go and make a little pile underneath the screen. And if you were to just uh, take that and pile it up into a, into a ball, make a little brick out of it, it's basically hashish. Okay? And uh, at that point, it's higher than the 25% that was on the, the whole plant material. Now we're typically talking 50 to 60% THC on this uh, uh, on, on this mechanical extract, okay? Uh, if we were to, uh, uh, to use infusion by, by uh, uh, dissolving the, uh, uh, the resin into something else, uh, we could uh, use carbon dioxide, supercritical fluid carbon dioxide, in order to extract the, uh, uh, the resin from the plant material. Uh, it's very efficient, but you have to have specialized equipment in order to do that, and it is for sale. Okay, uh, it's, uh, it's non-poisonous, it's non-flammable, it uh, it's actually works uh, fairly well. Uh, another uh, chemical ex extract is with butane, okay? 
Uh, it's actually more efficient for some of the terpenes than is supercritical CO2, but it is uh, very, very common. It's very inexpensive, but it's very, very flammable, very dangerous. I have literally seen uh, extract facilities that have, let's say, a four inch PVC pipe that's maybe three or four feet long. Uh, on the end of, uh, of one of it, put a, a cap, you know, a PVC cap that you can screw on. And, but then in that screw on cap, drill some holes, put a little screen on the, uh, on the inside of that cap. Now put a pound, two pounds of uh, uh, plant material inside there. And uh, through the top, uh, take a, uh, a butane cylinder that you can go down at the local uh, uh, welding shop and get. So how pure is that? It's certainly not 99.995% butane. Okay, uh, so it's got all sorts of other crap in it. But now, let, uh, turn, this, uh, turn this on, and under pressure, the butane is a liquid. And it goes whoosh and, uh, through the plant material, and it helps to dissolve some of that, uh, uh, that resin, and the resin starts dripping out the bottom, and you catch it in a bowl, okay? But along with that resin comes all of this butane. Butane is heavier than air. It sticks on, uh, it stays down on the floor, okay? There better not be anybody smoking in there. Okay? <laughs> and it's dangerous enough that if you turn on a light switch, there's a spark on the inside of the, uh, of the light switch when you turn it on or off. Okay? And it can, it can be combusted. Anybody who's uh, from crime labs that's done any clandestine uh, uh, laboratory work knows that you do not touch that light switch, you just might blow your ass up. Okay? Uh, so uh, if you watch some of these states, every week you see several different uh, news stories of uh, another garage got blown up uh, and you know two dead in news at 11. Uh, so uh, uh, but butane is, uh, is, is cheap and it's very very common. Individual people can do it with a, a small little butane uh, refill uh, canister that they would uh, refill their, uh, uh, their lighters with uh, and it works okay but it's dangerous. Uh, ethanol is one of the uh, compounds that you would use for, uh, for tinctures, or sublingual, uh, for, for taking a, uh, uh, an extract and, and having it in a liquid form so that you could put a drop or two under Johnny's tongue so that uh, you don't have to make a, a six-year-old smoke a doobie in order to give his, uh, <laughs> his medication. So you, you put a little bit uh, on, uh, on, under their tongue in order to, to get it absorbed. So ethanol is at least uh, compatible with the human body. Uh, so uh, uh, some of the, uh, the extracts are often done in uh, for tinctures with, with ethanol. But you can even use ice water, okay? There are ways in order to do this with, uh, uh, with simple ice water so that there's no, uh, uh, no sub chemical solvent uh, left over. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not as efficient, but if you have plenty of plant material, it's cheap and it's easy. Okay, these are some of the, uh, the edibles that, uh, that I made Mrs. Rubold buy. Okay, and uh, here we have uh, cookies, uh, we have uh, chocolate mints down here, uh, throat lozenges, okay, hard candy, gummy bears, okay, um, a medicinal patch like the, uh, uh, the nicotine patch that you would wear, and they have patches for, uh, uh, for, uh, for THC also, uh, the, uh, the e-cigarettes, okay, that, uh, that you, can, uh, uh, you can smoke with the, uh, uh, got the equivalent of about 72 doses in that one e-cigarette. Here's some brownies. Notice that uh, most of them are, they're all in uh, child-proof containers that you cannot see through so that a, uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, if, if a child sees that, it doesn't just necessarily recognize it as a drug, okay? Uh, now, that, that brownie, let's talk about that brownie for a second. Okay, now you and I, okay? That brownie is maybe about this big, okay? We could eat that three bites, maybe four bites, okay? You take five bites, okay? <laughs> that's 10 dosage units, okay? So that's enough to feed 10 people. Now I've visited some major police departments who, who know very well how to extract THC from plant material, but this is new to them trying to get it out of baked goods. They wanted to know what kind of procedures would they use in order to do these kind of extractions. So they needed help with that. But in the industry also, we find out that uh, things like homogeneity testing is very important because if that is in, in fact 10 dosage units, this portion right here versus this portion right here versus this portion right here, are you getting the same amount of drug in each one? I'll guarantee you, you are not. Okay, so that is a problem in the industry. 
And one of the other problems that, uh, that I, I was informed with, uh, with with this is that uh, in one major uh, uh, city, uh, let's say what it, let's say a six year old gets a hold of that drone. Okay. Sure. Now uh, the toxicity of THC is not such that uh, uh, that you're going to uh, uh, overdose from it. I'm a forensic uh, toxicologist by background. Okay? Uh, it's not going to be a, uh, a poisoning case, but they might be stoned enough that they don't know what they're doing. Okay? Uh, enough that uh, we have documented cases of uh, six and seven year olds jumping off the 10th floor of a building doing this, okay? thinking that they were Spider-Man shooting their little web out. Okay? Uh, other cases, or a new game that, uh, uh, that I was introduced to uh, called Winding. Okay, whereas it, you play this with a moving locomotive, okay, and here's a train going by, and you put your hands behind you, and you put your nose as close to that train as you can without touching your nose. Okay, have you ever seen a train car that has a handle out here that comes a little bit out? Okay, okay. guess what? Somebody loses. Okay, uh, so it's a lose-lose uh, uh, situation. But all of these types of uh, products here are going to take a different type of extraction procedures, different than the plant material itself. Okay, uh, so the the extracts often contain fats and sugars that you need to deal with uh, in the, in the extract, and uh, uh, you can extract it into into butter or cooking oil. Coconut oil works works very well, but uh, honey and glycerin are, are very popular also. The sublingual oils in ethanol. We talked about that. Chocolate mints. Uh, uh, baked goods, cookies, brownies, caramels, hard candy, lozenges, suckers, uh, soft gummy candy, uh, beverages, soft drinks, beer, pizza, jerky. Jerky is, uh, is new on the market. They, the, the jerky they have to be careful of because they can't make co uh, uh, chicken uh, jerky, they can't make uh, uh, pork jerky or beef jerky because that falls under FDA. But if they make it with wild game, if they make it with uh, peahen, if they make it with uh, uh, bison or elk or something like that, no laws for them. Okay, so they just make it with wild game meat. Okay, uh, uh, vapors, e-cigarettes. Okay, so specialized extractions for uh, for some of these uh, uh, for some of these elements. Now, if you do extract things. With, uh, with different solvents, whether it be the CO2, whether it's with ethanol, or whether it's with the, uh, uh, the, the butane, uh, then most states will require you to do a uh, residual solvent. How much of that solvent is left that the consumer will, uh, uh, will be consuming? Now, supercritical CO2 is nice because it just goes away, okay? It goes into the atmosphere, okay? But that butane, <laughs> if it was just butane, might not be so bad. But it'll have benzene, toluene, xylene, it'll have nonane, octane, uh, uh, decane, uh, uh, all sorts of crap in it that, uh, that you have no business consuming. Okay? Uh, so here is a, a typical headspace uh, extraction. Uh, I've even seen uh, extractions done with gasoline and naphtha before. Okay? This cannot be good for you. Okay? Uh, now, once you get all this data, using some kind of multivariant data analysis scheme, you've got more than 40 different analytical results coming from infrared, coming from uh, the GC, the LC, the LCMS, and all the different cannabinoids, all the different terpenes, and you take all that data together and you add about another 40 plus variables from the growing process, temperature, pH, what kind of soil, what kind of fertilizer, how much light, uh, what, what intensity of light, for how long. Okay? And you put all those things together, and if we can reproduce all of those, uh, uh, those different things, maybe we can get the same kind of a product out in the end. Okay? But there's so many different variables there. Trying to do that to, uh, just by your, yourself, uh, people are pulling their hair out because, uh, why did I change? It doesn't work anymore. Okay? That's a big issue to the growers. Okay? So trying to figure out the cannabis strain identification and product reproducibility. Uh, take some fancy software in order to uh, uh, to try to keep track of all of that stuff. Uh, so uh, here's some information for the pesticides. Well, uh, the pesticides here, uh, they all track along a line that we would expect. Okay, but every now and then we get one that is off in the uh, uh, in, in the nether region, uh, away from what we would expect. What was different about those particular 
uh, uh, products. Uh, was it more light? Was it less light? Was it a different amount of water? Uh, what, uh, was it a different type of soil? Okay, what variables were different that caused the pesticides or caused the cannabinoid ratios to be different in that particular case? Uh, so this is going to take us a couple of years in order to get good, solid data <coughs> from all of this stuff. Okay? Uh, so in the last slide, okay, uh, starting with the plant material, we can do uh, uh, terpene residual solvents by GC. We might do it, uh, some work by, uh, by infrared. Uh, we might be GCMS for pesticides and terpenes, uh, LC and LCMS for potency and mycotoxins and pesticides, uh, the ICPMS for metals. Something they have asked me to do is to come up with an automated extraction procedure for taking some of these different uh, edibles or some of the different plant materials and uh, uh, take a lot of the extraction uh, of, the, of the human being away from this. So that's uh, one of the projects that I'm going to be working on for 2016. Okay? Is that enough? Okay.